Hello and welcome to EPG Patshala program in Botany. I am Dr. Himlata Kotkar, currently working as an assistant professor at the Department of Botany, Savitri Bai Phule, Pune University. I completed my master's and PhD in biotechnology. Later, I joined the CSIR National Chemical Laboratory at Pune as a postdoctoral fellow. I have worked at the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology at Vienna, Germany, twice as a Max Planck India Visiting Fellow. Continuing with plant mineral nutrition, in this module, I will discuss three elements, boron, molybdenum, silicon, essential for overall plant growth and development. The learning objectives of this lecture are soil availability, uptake and transport in plants, functions and deficiency symptoms of boron, molybdenum and silicon. Let me begin with an introduction to boron. Of the 17 elements that are considered to be essential for overall plant growth and development, boron was long been considered to be required exclusively only for plants but not for animals. Requirement of boron in plant cells which is very specific supports this. However, increasing evidences have suggested essential roles for boron in other organisms including animals and bacteria. Boron in the form of boric acid or borate is an essential micronutrient element for plant growth and development. Boron is retained in soils by adsorption onto minerals and humic particles and by forming insoluble precipitates. A large number of soil parameters like soil texture, soil pH, moisture, temperature, organic matter, clay minerals, carbonate and oxide content may affect soil boron transformation and distribution in different fractions. In acidic soils, boron availability is low. Soil low in organic matter is deficient in boron than with high organic matter. Boron is not readily held by soil particles and tends to leach out easily beyond the root zones of many plants. Hence, fine textured silts and clays are not deficient in boron as compared to sandy soils. The range between boron deficiency and toxicity symptoms in plants is typically narrow that is 0.028 to 0.093 millimolar per litre for sensitive crops and 0.37 to 1.39 millimoles per litre for tolerant crops. Boron concentration in soil is generally reflected by the amount taken up by plants. Let us see how this takes place. Molecular, genetic and physiological studies have revealed that boron transport in plants not only occurs by passive diffusion across membranes but is also catalyzed by regulated transport proteins. These transporters function to support normal growth under both low and high boron conditions. Thus, channel mediated facilitated diffusion and energy dependent active transport against concentration gradients exist in boron transport systems. Two types of boron transporters, NIF51 and BOR1, as seen in the figure, both of which are important for efficient transport of boron across the plasma membrane under boron limitation have been reported in Arabidopsis thaliana. In the initial uptake process, NIP51, a boric acid channel facilitates boron influx to root cells. NIP5 is a gene upregulated by low boron supply in Arabidopsis roots. BOR1, a boron exporter, plays a key role in xylem loading. The Arabidopsis BOR1-1 mutant was isolated as being more susceptible to boron deficiency than the wild type. In BOR1-1, leaf expansion in upper leaves was severely inhibited under low boron conditions. BOR1 is expressed predominantly in the root pericycle cells surrounding the xylem. BOR1 is involved not only in boron transport into the xylem but also in boron distribution within shoots. Boron is expressed in shoots 
but it is not known how bore 1 and efflux transport of boron regulates distribution among leaves. It is possible that bore 1 may be involved indirect in boron from the xylem to phloem for preferential delivery to young leaves. Another transporter has also been shown to be involved in boron distribution in shoots. NIP61 is the gene most similar to NIP51. Mutant lines of NIP61 exhibited defects in the expansion of young leaves. Hence, it is proposed that NIP61 functions in xylem phloem transfer for preferential distribution of boron into young growing tissues. NIP51 increases the permeability of boric acid to cell membranes under boron limitation and facilitates influx of boron from the soil into root cells. Boron is exported by bore 1 out of the cells against the concentration gradient towards the xylem. Coordinated expression patterns of bore 1 and NIP51 are essential for efficient transcellular transport as NIF51 possibly facilitates influx following the concentration gradient that BOR1 generates. Expression of both NIF51 and BOR1 is decreased by transcriptional and post transcriptional regulation respectively under high levels of boron supply. To avoid overloading high concentrations to the shoots, down regulation of NIF51 and BOR1 is beneficial. The unusual nature of boron chemistry suggests the possibility of a wide variety of biological functions for the micronutrient. Boron is involved in numerous important processes including protein synthesis, transport of sugars, respiration, RNA and carbohydrate metabolism and the metabolism of plant hormones like indole acetic acid. Functions of boron are related to cell wall synthesis lignification and cell wall structure by cross-linking of cell wall polysaccharides as well as the structural integrity of biomembranes. It increases the transport of chlorine and phosphorus as a result of plasma lemma ATPase induction. Boron can stimulate proton pumping that causes hyperpolarization of the membrane potential. The membrane cell wall connection is boron dependent as kinase in the plasma membrane has an extracellular matrix connection with the pectin molecule. Boron was found to promote the structural integrity of biomembrane and the formation of lipid rafts. Physiological function of boron is to cross link two molecules of the cell wall pectin polysaccharide called as ramnogalactoironan 2, a highly conserved structural component in a wide range of plant species. Boron is immobile, so deficiency symptoms appear in the younger tissues first. Since all these functions are fundamental to meristematic tissues, boron deficiency is predominantly damaging actively growing organs such as shoot and root tips, stunting the whole plant. Flower retention, pollen formation, pollen tube growth or germination, nitrogen fixation, and nitrate assimilation are also affected. As boron is involved in cell division and development, its deficiency kills vegetative growing tips which consist the meristematic cell line. Death of terminal buds directly affects the growth of lateral shoots, the tips of which may also be deformed or die leaving a rosette on the plant called as witch's broom condition. Leaves usually become thick have a coppery texture and become curled and brittle and the growth of young leaves is inhibited. Tissue of boron deficient plants often break down prematurely causing brown flecks, necrotic spots, cracking and cocky areas in fruit and tubers. In sugar beet, boron deficiency leads to a condition called as heart rot. Boron deficiency hampers flowering and fruiting by retarding pollen germination and pollen tube development processes. Boron deficiency reduces fertility and fruit development becomes slow or non-existent depending on severity of the deficiency. Sometimes plant fails to set flowers or in case flowers are set they are aborted. 
deformed flowers are common symptom of boron deficiency. At the cellular level, boron deprivation harms numerous processes like cell wall synthesis, lignifications, cell wall structure, mitosis and cell elongation. Cell differentiation and development are badly affected and eventually bring about cell death. It causes internal tissues to disintegrate causing abnormalities such as distorted, cracked or hollow stems. Refer to the figure on the right where boron deficiency in banana is seen. With this we conclude discussions on boron. Let us begin with molybdenum which is another essential micronutrient for plant growth. When molybdenum is deficient, striking phenotypes can develop including nitrogen starvation responses and stem and leaf development disorders. Molybdenum is a trace element found in the soil and is required for growth of most biological organisms including plants and animals. The availability of molybdenum for plant growth is strongly dependent on the soil pH, concentration of adsorbing oxides, extent of water drainage and organic compounds found in the soil colloids. In alkaline soils, molybdenum becomes more soluble and is accessible to plants mainly in its anion form. In contrast, in acidic soils, molybdenum availability decreases as anion adsorption to soil oxides increase. Molybdenum is present in the lithosphere at average levels up to 2 to 3 mg per kg. In agricultural soils, molybdenum is present as many different complexes depending on the chemical speciation of the soil zone. Dissolved molybdenum available to plants is commonly found in the soluble anion form. This can adsorb onto positively charged metal oxides, clay minerals, dissolved organic compounds and carbonates. Soluble anion form can also complex with various ions in solution including sodium, potassium, calcium and magnesium and can also be complex with organic matter particularly humic and fulvic acids. Let us see how molybdenum is taken up and transported by plants. Molybdenum is active within the plant when complexed by the terrain compound name molybdenum cofactor abbreviated as MOCO. Only a few plant enzymes interact with MOCO. These are nitrate reductase, aldehyde oxidase, xanthine dehydrooxygenase and sulphide oxidase where molybdenum participates as a transition metal in reduction oxidation reactions. The transport mechanism has recently been characterized involving a class of transport proteins called MOT1. MOT1 is a relative of the sulphate transporter superfamily but does not appear to transport sulphate. In plants, the uptake of molybdate may occur through sulphate transport proteins as both molybdate and sulphate have similar chemical properties. Sulphur starvation can enhance molybdenum accumulation or alternately repress molybdenum uptake when supplied at increasing concentration. In tomato, the translocation of molybdate ions from the root to the shoot is reduced in the presence of external sulphate. However, uptake into roots did not appear to be influenced by sulphate. The plant sulphate transport protein called as SHST1 is able to enhance the uptake of molybdate when expressed in Saccharomyces cerevisiae sulphate transport mutant abbreviated as YSD1. So what are the deficiency symptoms of molybdenum in plants? Molybdenum deficiency symptoms in plants have been documented with varying severity depending on the species. In Brassicaceae, molybdenum deficiency is pronounced. Young plants show mottling, cupping, grey tinting and flaccid leaves. Young leaves show loss of lamina development called as whip tail as shown in the figure. Leathery leaves and meristem necrosis appear. Horticultural cereal and legume crops develop pale green leaves and necrotic leaf margins affecting whole plant growth. In oat and wheat, necrotic regions develop on the leaf blades 
leading to poor and shriveled seeds. Internodes shorten, leaf area decreases and chlorotic leaves develop in maize. In grapevines, molybdenum deficiency leads to a bunch development disorder called Millerandage, wherein bunches develop unevenly and fully mature berries are present alongside many underdeveloped berries as seen in the figure on the lower right. Let us discuss the third element in this module. Silicon is known to protect plants against various biotic and abiotic stresses, including metal toxicity. Therefore, silicon soil deficiency is considered as a limiting factor for plants such as rice and sugarcane that accumulate silicon. Fertilizers rich in silicon have to be applied for crops routinely to enhance their yields. Among the plant micronutrients, silicon is usually regarded as a beneficial element and is the second most abundant element in soil. Its availability to plants can increase 10% of total dry weight of the plant. Under natural conditions, silicon exists as silica as it has a strong affinity for oxygen. However, depending on the pH, it also exists in the silicate and silicic acid forms. Its concentration in the soil solution varies from 0.1 to 1.4 millimolar. Plants absorb it as silicic acid at pH below 9. So, how do plants take up and transport silicon? After the absorption of silicon from the soil into the root, it gets translocated to the shoot area where it can stimulate various physiological responses such as plant growth and development. Silicon is taken up and transported to the shoots as silicic acid where it is converted to hydrated amorphous silica and stored on cell walls which forms the silica cuticle and silica cellulose double layers on stem, leaf and hull surfaces. Many transporters are required for the uptake, translocation and distribution of silica. Silica transporter genes have been identified in rice, barley and maize roots. Two different types of silica transporter have been reported in different plant species. They are channel type transporters and efflux transporters. Let us have a look first at the channel type silica transporters. These facilitate the passive transport of silica across the plasma membrane between the external solution that is the apoplast and the plant cells. They belong to a NIP subfamily of aquaporin like proteins. They have six transmembrane domains and two motifs. Although LSI1 is a bidirectional passive, it functions as an influx transporter of silica in plants. The second type are the efflux silica transporters. The efflux transporter LSI2 of silica is responsible for the transport of silica out of the plant cells. LSI2 belongs to an uncharacterized putative anion transporter family with 11 plasma membrane domains. It shows similarity with the arsenide efflux transporter arsenide B identified in bacteria and archae. The efflux transporter of silicon by LSI2 is an active process that is driven by the proton gradient across the plasma membrane. Differences in the expression pattern and tissue or cellular localization of LSI1 and LSI2 determine the different roles in silicon transport and ability to accumulate silicon in plants. LSI1 and 2 expressed in the roots are involved in silicon uptake. In rice, both of them are located at the same layers but with different polarity indicating that the cooperation of both are required for uptake as seen in the figure. Generally, silicon is not considered as an essential element, but it is one of the most advantageous elements for numerous plant species. It stimulates various physiological responses such as growth, development and optimization of enzymatic activities. In a complete life cycle, plants are continuously exposed to various abiotic stresses and sometimes 
multifaceted stresses. These stresses in turn cause the generation of various reactive oxygen species such as singlet oxygen, superoxides, hydrogen peroxides or hydroxyl radicals in cells. Exogenously, silica can improve the ability of ROS scavenging by regulation of antioxidant enzyme activity. Thus, under a biotic and biotic stress environment, silica plays an imperative role and protects plants of various species by regulating other mineral nutrients. Silica is deposited as amorphous silica in the cell walls where it interacts with pectins and polyphenols and enhances cell wall rigidity and strength. Rice is known to have high deposits of silica and therefore extensively studied in response to its transporters upon various biotic and abiotic stresses. The figure shows wild type rice and a mutant with low silica accumulation due to defects of silica transporter LSI1 grown in the field. In contrast to the wild type rice without disease and insect damage shown as A, low silica accumulation in the mutant LSI1 resulted in discoloration and low fertility of grains as shown in B, insect damage and aphids as shown in C, brown rice plant hopper as shown in D, green rice leaf hopper as shown in E and disease infection as seen in F. Repeated cropping and the application of chemical fertilizers have depleted the amount of silica available to plants. Deficiency of silica can cause various abnormalities with respect to plant growth, development and reproduction. In tomato, deficiency symptoms were reported to appear after first bud flowering stage. New leaves in tomato are malformed showing curving, warping, hardening and thickening. Leaves turn slightly yellow in color with necrotic spots on the lower leaves which are gradually spreading to the upper leaves. In case of severe deficiency, the plant dries up. To summarize, distribution of these three elements in the soil fractions is dependent on soil characteristics. Knowledge of these elements in the soil fractions is fundamental to understanding the binding forms, dynamics and plant availability. Specific mechanisms exist for uptake, transport and distribution within the plants. All these elements are required in different quantities by the plant for proper growth and yield. Imbalances show up as nutritional deficiencies which can be identified and corrected by fertigation in agricultural systems. Thank you for your patient hearing.